Hello and welcome to SAE Tomorrow Today. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored of Dr. Brian Holt, CTO of Parkopedia. On today's episode, Dr. Holt and I discussed why the future of parking is frictionless. We hope you enjoy this episode. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. We're excited to have you here today because parking's important, parking's crucial. Every journey begins and starts with parking, yet it's complicated, it's frustrating, it's annoying. Why? Wow, what an opening question. I mean, I think, I think the answer is really that the industry is still back where it was 50 years ago. Honestly, parking is a very thin margin industry and there's not been that much investment. And so, you know, you go places and you're looking at meters that look like they come from the 60s or the 70s. You have to fish out for coins. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, do you, how many people still carry coins with them and think, oh, I don't have enough coins to, you know, to fill up the meter? Uh, it's, it's the most frustrating thing. And I think this is really the problem. It's a lack of vision for how to make parking easy and it's a lack of investment and perhaps also a lack of, uh, of profit motive there. Um, so yeah, multitude of, of answers. So you have the thin margins and, and for a while, most parking places didn't take credit cards. Is that like, they're like, oh, we don't want that 3%, 4% to, mm -hmm. to eat into our thin margins. Let's just force people to go to a laundromat or go to a bank and, and get quarters and not have to pay the percentage. Exactly. Exactly. The parking industry, yeah, very, very thin margins. And I think they, they move when forced to move. So, you know, thinking about COVID and the move away from contact, from, from contact, so to contactless, that was one of the things that I think really motivated the industry to, to change and to adopt contactless forms of payments because that's what customers were demanding, not even requesting, demanding at this point, because this is where we'd move to as a society. You mentioned they were forced to move, but Parkopedia, you weren't forced to move. You choose to you chose to innovate. Why? Why did you choose to innovate, and how are you making parking easier so that consumer that goes there, they're not like, oh, here we go again. I think this is why Parkopedia exists. We exist to make parking easy, to help drivers find and pay for parking. And really, it all started you know, nearly 15 years ago when, uh, when our CEO, Eugene, was out in San Diego looking for parking and he was really frustrated. He just, you know, he was at a conference and he didn't know where to park. And I think everyone has that same experience. Everyone's had that experience before. You know, where can I park? All I want to do is just get rid of my car as quickly as I can because I want to go somewhere. You know, no one really goes to a car park. I mean, unless you're a parking geek. <laughs> no one goes to a car park to go and appreciate the architecture and the, you know, the layout of the building and the traffic flow, no one does this. So there's, there's a clear demand and there's a problem. Parking is painful. And so what Parkopedia does is it, it takes away that pain. It makes it easy. And we started with our first product, which is really helping the driver throughout their journey. And I'll, I'll just quickly describe that journey. So the first thing you do as a driver is you think about where you want to go. And then you think, okay, so where can I park that's near to where I want to be? So we answer that question with static data. And we've got an enormous database, which we've been collecting data for over the past, you know, like I said, nearly 15 years. And it's, it's lots of metadata about car parks, answering the question, where can I park? So you want to go, you know, to somewhere in central London. Okay, great. So we've got all of these different on-street car park, on-street parking segments and off-street car parks, and we can tell you loads of stuff about them. We can tell you what the price is, we've got a calculator, what are the hours of operation, what are the restrictions, who's the operator, etc., etc. Just so many different attributes to help you answer this question, where can I park? But if that was all that we offered, I think you'd be frustrated because just knowing that there's a car park there doesn't really solve your problem you also need to know whether or not you're likely to find a space. And that's where our predictive availability comes in. So this is the second part. It's what we call dynamic data. We then make a prediction. When I get there in 10 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour, what is the probability that I will find a space? Because ultimately, I don't really care that there's car parks there. I want to know, am I going to be able to get rid of my car there? 
And then to make it easier still, okay, now that I know that I can park there, well, can I reserve a space? Yes, we offer that. Or maybe access and pay, you know, I'm going to drive up to the car park and if it, if the, the parking facility supports it, then I'm going to, I'm going to perhaps just drive in and it's, you know, it's, it's all connected. ANPR is connected to the head unit. It's detected my number plate. It starts the parking session when I drive in and when I drive out, it automatically recognizes I've just drive, driven out and, uh, and it'll charge my credit card, right? I mean, this is where we're going. This is the, this is the future. And it's all about making the experience as frictionless and as simple and as painless really as possible. And then the last product that we, that we offer is indoor maps. And that is really, okay. So now in a future where a car is autonomous, how does that autonomous vehicle park itself? How does it navigate inside a car park? But that's autonomy, that's AVP in the future. We're thinking about how we can use these indoor maps now. And so we can, we can assist drivers, you know, perhaps to navigating their electric vehicle down into a car park, you know, up to the third floor, for example, where there is an EV charger that's available. So that's kind of the future. That's, that's where we're going to uh, with these products and, and kind of how they fit together. The frictionless is the big thing. I, I used to live in Beverly Hills, and there was a thing called the Rodeo Drive Committee, and they, they, um, all, all the manicure and all the way that Rodeo drives run, they would oversee it as a, as a committee part of City Hall. And the number one thing was traffic and parking were the complaints, and the, and the merchants on the street wanted to ensure that individuals that are shopping in the store had, had easy access to parking, and the city passed an ordinance. It was two hours free parking. And if it was full, there was a valet person there to ensure that individuals could continue to shop because without if there was friction, well, I'm going to go shop somewhere else. I'm not going to give shop there and the, and the tax dollars go to the city. Once you can eliminate the friction around parking, then the stores around those streets or the, or the restaurants, for that matter of fact, they can increase their business because it all goes back to parking at the end of the day. Exactly. So, yeah, so you want to be able to drive to the car park, not even the car park. I mean, ultimately, what you really want as a driver is you want to go to the destination and you want to ditch your car at some point along the way. And you want to know with some certainty that when you finish doing whatever you did, shopping, going to the restaurant, going to the cinema, you can get your car back and your car is going to be safe. It's not going to be dented. It's not going to have been taken for a joyride by some valet. I'm not saying all do that, but you know, there have been cases and you know, people are genuinely concerned. So you want to know you're going to get your car back and you want to, you want to know that your car is going to be in the same condition that you left it. Exactly. And that's all you care about. You don't want to have a Ferris Bueller's Day Off moment. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> that, that no, you don't, don't. want to happen. <laughs> well, let's dive into the, the data here for a moment. The, the data that Parkopedia has collected is massive. You have mapped 70 million parking spaces in 89 countries. I repeat, 70 million parking spaces in 89 countries. From a technical standpoint, how is this accomplished? That's a lot of data. Uh, the answer is hard work. <laughs> that, that's the real answer. But okay, so you, but you asked technically, okay, how do you do this? So it's a combination. I think of our data analysts as basically detectives. This is what they do. They, they are uh, sleuths. They uh, have a look at, you know, parking operators' websites at regular intervals. They're viewing satellite aerial imagery, you know, dash cam imagery where it's, where we can get hold of it, boots on the ground. You know, it's basically every tool that we have in our toolbox to get that data. And in some cases, we find that, you know, our data is perhaps sometimes more up to date than even the operator. Uh, so, you know, we will have had boots on the ground. We'll be, you know, looking at the board. We'll be looking at the prices. And then someone else in the data team looks at this and says, well, okay, their website's not been updated yet. But we, we, know, we know which is more accurate because... We're you know, applying all of these different techniques to make sure that the data is as fresh and as accurate as possible. So you're taking multiple sources of inputs into that data. How often is it updated? Because not all the source of data will update in the same intervals. Uh, we consider data to be fresh if it has been reviewed within the last 12 months. So if if a data analyst has looked at it and has checked it, you know, against one of these various sources. But you're absolutely right. You know, car parks in, say, New York City might might change their price every three months. 
And this is, you know, this is something definitely that we, we need to factor in and consider. But then there will be car parks, you know, in some rural location where, I don't know, have they ever updated their prices? I don't know. <laughs> it, let's use New York City for an example. There is a, a high abundancy of connectivity in the city. And when connectivity, I'm talking about either 5G, LTE, or broadband. Do you have mm -hmm. some of these larger national operators that can tap give you api access so you can get real-time update on the parking prices uh, yes yes so uh, we do some technical integrations as well to get the data um in a more efficient way absolutely because if you're getting that data that way then you're get, achieving your goal of eliminating friction you're having a happier customer the business improvement, they're loving it because business is booming because it all goes back, as I said earlier, it all goes back to parking. So you have the 70 million parking spaces today in 89 countries. How are you planning to scale that over the next decade? We're kind of getting to the point now where when it comes to off-street car parks, you know, how many car parks are there really in the world? I mean, I think we have something like 350,000. I haven't checked very recently, but maybe 350, nearly 360,000 in our database. How many car parks are there really in the world? And so this is a bit of a challenge. We don't really know because maybe there are car parks we've not yet discovered, but I think we've, we've certainly got most of them and certainly in the big cities, we've got them. So, you know, perhaps as you go out, maybe outside the really big cities, maybe you go to, to a small town with, I don't know, I, I live in a relatively small town uh, far away from uh, from a big urban area area excuse me and um, there are car parks near me that are on our database so you know I'm 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 uncertain uh, where is the limit where when is the point going to come where we realize do you know what we've found them all there are no more car parks but that's off street on street is a different matter on street I mean there are there are millions, there are probably tens of millions of on-street segments. And by segments, I mean, you know, maybe three or four parking spots on the street. And we map each of these as individual segments. And, you know, we mark down the restrictions and we know, you know, how many spaces there are, et cetera. So how many on-street segments? I mean, there must be, there must be many, many segments. And the only way to really scale that is going to be through using computer vision on in-car and on aerial or satellite imagery and automatically extracting that information. When you look at off-street parking for car parks, are you now monitoring the number of, of EV chargers and if it's a, a level two charger, it's a supercharger, are you starting to gather that data now? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So thinking about EV, we are not necessarily collecting every EV charger that, you know, that exists in a particular country. We're thinking here about park and charge. So you want to park your car and while you leave it, you want to charge it. And there are a lot of charges that charge point operators have put inside car parks. That th those charges are actually <laughs> sometimes, sometimes not that useful. And let me clarify because you need to know a lot about the charger and you need to be know about the parking restrictions and the car park. So, you know, there was a, an article, I think it was in the Guardian a few months ago about a guy who went to park in Little or Aldi, I can't remember. And sorry, not to park, he went to charge in this car park and he didn't realize that there were parking restrictions. So he was hit with some massive fine when all he was doing was charging his car because, you know, the charge point operator app said, go, there's a, you know, there's a, an EV charger that you can use. But I think that this is a great example of where our service is going to make a big difference. You need to know about the, the characteristics of the parking facility in which you want to park. What are the hours of operation? What are the restrictions? What are the charges for parking? And you want to be able to marry those up to the EV uh, charger. So what, you know, what is the power? What are the connect connection types, et cetera? Your app is telling them the rules and regulations. Perhaps it's, it's it's one hour parking while charging and you can't leave it there all day to, to, to hog a spot. So you're telling them all the information they need so they're not going to get hit with that giant fine. So, oh, this is a bad experience. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So helping drivers to, you know, to find and pay for parking and charging. 
And the key there is also the paying for the charging. So, you know, similar to our static data product, um, in fact, EV follows a similar evolution, right? So static data, where can I park? Then what is the probability that I'll find a parking space? Then how can I pay for it? Same with EV. Where can I find a charger? Okay, great. You know, I know that there are chargers here and that they will fit my vehicle. But are any of them available? Will they be available in a half an hour? So this is the future to which we're, we're headed. And uh, similar to our dynamic predictions for parking, we're also looking at how we can provide dynamic predictions uh, or availability predictions for EVs. That's not out in the market right now, but this is definitely something we're looking at. And then subsequently, how do I make that payment process as frictionless as possible? Let's, uh, let's say there's a hypothetical scenario here. A consumer pulls into an off-street parking. They are using your, your park and charge service. Um, I'm under the assumption they have their credit card on file. They pull up the spot and says, okay, you may stay here for an hour. You may not linger. They say, okay, I can get, say, 40% battery in the hour. Do they just plug it in, charge to the car, and then an hour they leave? Well, it's still up to the driver to decide what they want to do. And the driver is still in control of their car. So, yeah, um, uh, uh, that's that's how we would envision it working. I mean, perhaps there are integrations within the car. So, you know, uh, I'm thinking about in the future how we could do this. You know, notifications to a driver, your session is nearly up, you know, pinging them on their phone, this kind of thing. That That could be done. But I think there's also an experience that the automotive company might want to control around that charging, et cetera. But putting the pieces together and looking to the future here, it seems that you're laying the foundation for an autonomous electric vehicle to go into a spot and charge and still be completely uh, programmed to do what it's told and not to break rules and regulations. Uh, this is, I think, where our indoor maps uh, really comes in. So indoor maps support automated valet parking. They are a necessary prerequisite for what's called AVP type one. So maybe before I go into a bit more detail, I'll just take a moment to explain automated valet parking and kind of the three different uh, flavors, slightly confusingly described as AVP type one, type two, and type three, but let me explain. So type one is this idea that the intelligence is in the car. So a car, you know, and we've seen so many examples now of the, the tech industry developing smart cars that are able to drive themselves. And this is the idea, the intelligence is in the vehicle. But in order to do this, and you want to drive around, or your car wants to drive around inside a car park, it needs to be able to understand its environment. It needs to have a map. So it could create that map while it's driving around. That's, that's quite complicated. It's possible, but it's complicated. Or it could just use a map. So this is kind of type one, and that's what we're targeting. Type two is where the intelligence is in the infrastructure. So if the intelligence is in the infrastructure, it means that cars can be basically drive by wire, kind of dumb robot controlled vehicles, drive by wire enabled vehicles that get controlled by the infrastructure and moved around. And then slightly confusingly, type three is some kind of hybrid between type one and type uh, two. All of these descriptions are described or are specified in the ISO standard 23374, uh, which Parkpedia is contributing to. So type one, type two, type three. So this is the, the automated valet parking systems um, ISO standard. Now, type two is great for places like logistics, where you, know, you can actually afford to install very expensive infrastructure in, you know, like LIDARs, lots of cameras, lots of communications equipment, etc. inside a, maybe a gigantic car park, like, I don't know, at the end of a production line, where, you know, you can autonomously drive, or in this case, maybe the better example, better description is to say that, you know, the infrastructure drives the vehicle in an automated way off the production line and into an open parking spot. But the question is, will that really work for consumers? So we've seen an example of this out in Germany. Um, perhaps you're familiar with the, the Bosch Daimler example in Mercedes-Benz Museum and Stuttgart you know, uh, Airport P6, where Bosch, who honestly is the market leader here, has installed a complex system for type two that can 
drive Mercedes-Benz vehicles around the car park and park them for you. So that's AVP type two. And when a lot of people think about AVP or type in, you know, in a search engine, automated valet parking, they'll be directed to this. But the big question is, can that scale? And can that scale commercially? So do we believe that there will be a world in which cars are level four automated and are able to drive themselves on the public roads? So it's the, it's the, it's the automated driving system that is now driving this vehicle, but yet it navigates into an off street car park and then it has to hand over control to the infrastructure to navigate it into the car park. I don't see that happening. That seems crazy. It's going to be very difficult, probably for political reasons around source code and company policies. And then you're seeing a large trend in the autonomy industry where a lot of the large uh, companies on the past car side are divesting their real estate. They do not want to own real estate. They're leasing assets. If you look at how they're looking at for charging parks, saying, okay, let's say there's a Live Nation shack and at a concert, let's say parking holds 10,000 cars perhaps and the people go home by 3 a.m. Perhaps 3 a.m. to 10 a.m. we can go reuse that space and charge. So it's going to be really interesting to see how it is because there's a big movement now to reuse the parking space. And if that seems like that creates an advantage for Parkopedia, so you can say, okay, Live Nation has designated rows 1 through 10, uh, A through F, as autonomous zones from, uh, say, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. That seems like it's a really good integration for Parkopedia to scale. I think in terms of Parkopedia's business model, we don't, we certainly don't have ambitions to operate infrastructure inside car parks. We're not, a, you know, a, a parking facility operator. Uh, we don't want to have uh, the physical infrastructure. I think there are others that might want to do that. What we want to be able to do is to help drivers find and pay for parking at scale. And that at scale matters because we don't want something that just works for one car park. It's got to work for hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of car parks. So this is why I'm thinking about, you know, if we're going to have automated valet parking, the intelligence must be in the vehicle. You know, no doubt the OE, I mean, OEMs are putting in loads of money, loads of effort to be able to develop this. At some point, it is coming. You will be able to buy a car that can drive itself. I mean, I'm not talking about level two, you know, like Tesla or GM Super Cruise or something. I'm talking about where you will actually legally be allowed to sit in the passenger seat and take a nap while your car is driving you. This is where, you know, and this is clearly level four. And so that's coming. It will come at some point. I don't know when that's going to be. Um, I think the industry thought that it was going to be 2020. Then it was 2021. Now we're in 2022 and we've realized actually the problem was harder. But, you know, that doesn't change the fact that it's going to happen at some point. And at that point, you know, cars are going to be perfectly uh, suited to you know, to going off and parking themselves, dropping you off the destination that you want to be. You know, you want to go to the hospital where you climb out at the front door at the hospital and your car goes off and parks itself. And when you're ready, your car comes to collect you. You go to the shopping mall, just like a valet. You give your keys to the valet, same idea. You climb out of the car and you take out your phone and you press park and your car parks itself. This is, this, this is definitely going to happen. And this is AVP type one where the intelligence is in the car. It's 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 going to happen. Level four will happen. When, on the backside of that, even though you don't build the infrastructure, you don't operate the infrastructure, you think a lot about the infrastructure. You mentioned the architecture of parking garages. Will they eventually be redesigned since the, the vehicles can be put closer together? Will that will be a complete rethink of how the, let's call it the parking spaces are laid out? It's quite possible that you won't need parking as close to the destination as is currently provided. So in other words, if your car is able to park itself, then you could drive to some place which is, you know, a, a beautiful shopping mall in, I don't know, Kensington or some expensive part of London, but your car can go and park itself on a brownfield site two miles away. It doesn't have to be right there next to the, the, the shopping mall, right? 
So this is actually quite interesting. And this further, I think, uh, strengthens the point of you know, autonomy or at least intelligence in the vehicle, where a vehicle is able to drive on the street network by itself, level four, then find the car park that it wants to, then go into the car park and park for the hour or two hours that you're going to be away. So, yeah, I think, um, I think there is going to be less parking. I think you will find that parking spots uh, are narrower. Obviously, if cars don't have to open doors, you know, for people to get out, you can, you can pack them in more, more tightly. There would be ideas. Cars may have to be able to talk to each other. I mean, you could imagine a brownfield site, lots and lots of cars. They park, you know, one of them gets parked in. How does it get out? It has to signal to the cars around it, you know, for them to move. So I think, you know, that, that kind of technology is still a way off. Uh, I know we've got, you know, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to X, but being at a point where a car could, you know, send a message via, I don't know, Bluetooth or something to those within a certain radius, and they can all coordinate their efforts to move out the way. <laughs> this, I mean, this sounds very futuristic, but, you know, for some of the things that you're talking about, packing them in more tightly, that's going to have to happen. The Kensington example is a wonderful one. You think about it and you perhaps have more commerce, but let's say you want to spend the day shopping in Kensington and then you want to go for an afternoon stroll in Hyde Park. Well, then perhaps on the North uh, Hyde Park corner, your vehicle can, can meet you there. You say, okay, vehicle, I'm no longer in Kensington. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on Hyde Park corner. Oh, okay. There's just so many different things about the convenience or if you get an alert on your phone, there's a rainstorm coming. Summon car. I don't, I don't want to get soggy today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There's a lot to think about here. I mean, there are logistics. So, you know, you want to be able to summon to any point. Well, that could be open to abuse. You know, people could just knowing that their car is going to come preemptively summon, but maybe there isn't you know, maybe there are traffic rules there. Maybe they're, you know, they're double yellow, so you can't actually park or you can't, you know, even temporarily park waiting for the driver. So there's a lot to think about here to, to make this work. But this is definitely where we're going with this. This is going to happen. Let's do, let's, let's stay in Hyde Park Corner, for example. Perhaps there's a, a dedicated autonomous vehicle drop off and pickup zones where those vehicles can pull in there, similar to a bus, five minute loading, unloading time. If that becomes the future, will that data get ingested into Parkopedia and say, okay, this spot is now zoned for drop off and pick up? I can definitely imagine that. I mean, certainly now we already have park in, park out events. So we know when cars are, are, are parking, when they're, not, when, they're, when they're leaving. I would certainly expect that we would know that. And uh, yeah, we'd be able to flash it up on, on the map, perhaps on the map that's on your, on your phone. Yeah, definitely. From a day-to-day -day perspective, how are you thinking about autonomy? You're running all these crazy scenarios through your head. What if this? What if this? No, I can't do that. Are you running different scenarios of trying to prepare Parkopedia for the future of autonomy as the, as the CTO? I think automated valet parking is still a way away still. And really, there are some other problems that we can solve right now that will lay the groundwork. So, for example, when you drive around on the street network, you have line of sight to satellites, so you know where you are, and the famous blue dot can tell you where you are on the map. <laughs> but when you drive into a car park, you go dark, right? So as a human right now driving my car, when I drive into a car park, it goes dark. I no longer have a navigation experience inside a large car park, right? I mean, that is one problem we can fix immediately just using indoor maps. And there's a second problem, though, and that is... How do you localize yourself? How do you know where you are in that car park? That's a difficult problem. You no longer have line of sight to satellites. So you need other ways to localize. So this is using, you know, your odometry, wheel odometry, perhaps an inertial measurement unit. You may have a forward facing camera. You potentially got a map. How do you, how do you fuse all of the, the information from these sensors to make sense of where you are and then feed that back to the driver through the head unit? So these are the things that we're looking at right now as, as things we can work on today uh, around autonomy. From a, a technical standpoint, uh, garages, underground garage, they're GPS denied. How are you creating the, the detailed okay. indoor maps? Yeah, exactly. So to create maps, you need two things. You need to know where you are to create the map, but you need the map to know where you are. So 
If you're creating a map on the street network, you have line of sight to satellites, you know where you are, that means that you can create a map. Because what you're saying is, when I was here, I observed all of these things around me, and then you can use that information, you can build that up. But when you are not, not able to work out where you are, you have to use a different technique. So we've used something called simultaneous localization and mapping. So you estimate where you are at the same time as saying, when I was there, this is what I saw. And so this is a robotics technique. It's been around for a while. We developed our own in-house to uh, fuse our LiDAR data and the camera and the inertial measurement unit and GPS data that we're getting on our remote mapping vehicle. Uh, so we've written the software, so we create these detailed point clouds, 3D point clouds that are colorized that represent the environment. And then we turn those digital twins into uh, maps. And you work with some of the, the largest OEMs. What has the feedback been from them on indoor mapping? Like, yes, 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 go, go, go. Uh, yes, absolutely. It's it's very exciting. You know, these the large OEMs are definitely thinking about it. They're working on it. They recognize that it's a hard problem. We need scales. So, you know, Parkopedia has collected data in nearly a thousand car parks all across Europe. That was a prerequisite. They, you know, the automotive industry needed this needed confidence that this would not just work in one or two car parks, but it could work across Europe. So we've done that. Uh, we've completed a number of proof of concepts. They've, you know, invariably been successful. Really, what we're looking at now is actually rolling this out into production. And I think, you know, you will see this within the next, the next few years, not too far away. And then, as you look towards the future, will your software be integrated into the in-vehicle entertainment systems or, or the in-dash and in these large OEMs who are your customers and partners? So certainly, our data will be integrated. Parkopedia, so far, the business model hasn't been to, to license our software. So, you know, we offer, we expose data and services through our APIs. Those are being consumed by millions of vehicles right now. I, I see that happening and I see the uptake continuing. Um, I think the future is bright there. That's wonderful because you're creating a great service and you're, and you're eliminating friction, which raises the big question. We all agree on this, that the future of parking is frictionless. But in your opinion, what is the future of parking? Well, you said it, frictionless. <laughs> because, <laughs> be, because really, parking is the kind of thing that people don't want to think about. You don't want to, you, you just want to drive to the car park and ditch your car. Because like we said at the beginning of this conversation, no one ever visited a car park because they thought it was beautiful. It's, you know, it's a necessary evil, if I can say that, to get rid of the car. And if we can make that as convenient and as frictionless and as pleasant an experience as possible for the driver, help the driver find their car again when they've lost it in the car park, perhaps in the future, get that car to the front of the car park or better still to their destination, then, then I think we've solved parking. You've solved it and that individual's more likely to, to go somewhere. And Brian, as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like our listeners to take away with them? I think parking is much more exciting than many people perhaps give it credit for. Uh, there's a lot to think about here. There's, there's a vast amount of data. There's a huge ecosystem, you know, and as you're driving to that car park, you know, perhaps putting your credit card in the meter, spare a thought for us who, who do this day in, day out. That's a great way to wrap things up. Parking is exciting, as Brian said, because today is tomorrow. Tomorrow is today and the future is Parkopedia. Brian, thank you so much for coming on SAE Tomorrow Today. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. Be sure to join us next week as we speak with Dr. Eliana Fu, Industry Manager at Trumpf. She'll share how the company aims to improve supply chains with 3D printing and how Trump sees the future of additive and traditional manufacturing. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.